imagine it's 2040 and we all drove here today in our shiny new EV. It's comfortable, it's familiar, and yet it solved all the problems of our old petrol-guzzling cars that were polluting the air and warming the earth. This is the updated model. It's an environmentally friendly, battery-powered car. It's our solution to the climate crisis. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. It's not as simple as replacing one technology with another. Now, we know climate change is the biggest threat facing humanity and that we need to rapidly reduce our emissions. But building the technologies for this transition is leading to new mining for minerals like copper, cobalt, lithium, graphite and nickel. And of all the minerals we need, half are for just one technology, electric vehicles. The battery in every EV uses several hundred kilograms of minerals and most of these come from mining. So, if we replace every car on the road with an EV, the mining impacts will be huge. EVs are a good thing, there's no question, and we need them as part of the transition. But in many ways, isn't mining and overconsumption what got us into this problem? And now we're trying to mine and consume our way out of it. We're just mining different materials. So, why does this matter? And surely this mining isn't as bad as mining fossil fuels? Well, yes, we need to put a halt to mining fossil fuels immediately. But it's not about what type of mining is better or worse or more or less. All of it matters. Mining for the green transition has impacts, and that matters too. We're facing a climate crisis, but we're also facing a biodiversity crisis. And many of these minerals are found in sensitive and fragile ecosystems. Half of all these minerals are found on indigenous lands. If we are doing this transition in the name of saving the planet, it should not come at the cost of sacrificing communities and ecosystems. These are some of the mines where the supply chains begin for EVs. Over 70% of the world's cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Here, Congolese workers in large industrial mines are exploited. They face violence and racism and they work in unsafe conditions. Many are paid as subcontractors, so they earn as little as $2.50 a day, which is below the living wage. So, despite working, they continue to be trapped in poverty. These mines produce the cobalt that goes into the batteries of all the major EV manufacturers. Many families in this area rely on mining. Some work in informal mining, in dangerous hand-dug tunnels that extend tens of metres underground. These tunnels frequently collapse, and it is not known how many people have died because these deaths go unreported. Another mineral, nickel. Over half of the world's nickel is found in Indonesia, and recently, $14 billion of international investment has poured in for new mines and smelters. Contaminated soil from the mines has turned the ocean red and brown. Land and crops have been destroyed, and sometimes the air is so polluted that it's difficult to breathe. If we continue on the pathway that we are, we could need 40 times more nickel by 2040. Is that in any way feasible or sustainable? And half of the world's lithium is found under the desert salt flats on the borders of Argentina, Bolivia and Chile. Here, to extract lithium, brine needs to be pumped from the surface and this uses vast amounts of water, two million litres just to produce one tonne of lithium. This is in a fragile desert ecosystem, one of the driest places on Earth and it's already impacted by climate change. And here, in Australia, we are the number one lithium producer. But we by no means have a clean record in relation to mining. And we are a world leader when it comes to biodiversity loss. Lithium mining was even being considered under old growth forests in Western Australia until community protests brought this to a halt. How much of the country do we want to keep digging up when so few wild places remain? Here and across the globe, mining continues to happen on land sacred to indigenous people who never had the option to say no. Many communities remain in poverty while billions of dollars is made in profits from land that was stolen from them. And even the remotest parts of the ocean are under threat from plans to mine the deep sea. Communities in the Pacific are leading a protest against this, worried about the impacts it could have. We don't even understand the deep sea to know what we could potentially be destroying. So EVs haven't created the problems with mining, but the issue is that this transition is driving new mining 
at a huge scale. And there are climate denialists who will use this information to say that EVs are bad, and that is not what I am saying. We do need EVs as part of the transition. But we can't be repeating the mistakes of our old fossil fuel-powered economy in our new renewable economy. A transition that is done for saving the planet and humanity needs to be done in a way that doesn't create harm. It needs to be done in a way that is just and equitable. So, how can we do this? How can we have a just transition? We could have new battery technologies, efficient production, reuse, recycling, and these will all play a part, but it's going to take many years before they have a significant impact. We also need to mine more responsibly. We need to ensure worker safety, respect indigenous rights, and protect ecologically significant places. But this doesn't solve the issue of the huge amount of minerals required, which will always have some impact. The most important thing we need to do is reduce our demand for minerals. And to do this, we need to reduce our reliance on cars, EVs or otherwise, and particularly in cities. We don't just need to change what powers our vehicle, but we need to change how we get around. We need to ramp up investment in electrified public transport and infrastructure for walking and cycling. And we need to redesign our cities so that we can access essential services like retail and healthcare and green space without needing to drive there. Doing this will reduce the amount of minerals we need and it will also reduce emissions much more quickly than just relying on EVs. So I imagine you might be thinking, everyone here knows public transport's a good idea, but if we need to reduce emissions quickly, surely we need to focus on the easy solution of EVs. The thing is, though, EVs aren't an easy solution. Yes, public transport, it's challenging and it's costly and it will take many years, but so will changing every car on every road across the world to an EV. That will take decades and it's not happening even fast enough now. Investing in public transport is also a more cheaper way to reduce emissions. Globally, 30 billion US dollars of public money was invested into EV subsidies in 2021. Why don't we use more of that public money for public transport and we'll have a greater impact? Our transport system is already going to have to change, so why don't we use this as an opportunity to redesign it to one that actually meets our needs? Instead of locking ourselves into a future based on cars and all the existing problems that we know they create. We need fewer cars, but we also need smaller cars. <laughs> the bigger the car, the bigger the battery, and the more mining that is required. A small EV might have a battery that weighs 300 kilograms. A big one could be two or three times that, or more. There are some companies in the US that have even stopped manufacturing small EVs in order to make more large SUVs and trucks. It's not because people don't want to buy small EVs, they do but it's because the larger cars are more profitable. We also need to be designing them so that they can be repaired. Whole cars are being scrapped because of a problem with the battery. How is that sustainable? We are in a climate crisis, but when we look to the solutions, we need to ask, why are we in this position? Where will it get us if we try to solve it with the same approach that got us here? Swapping one car for another it's not going to solve our problems. Instead, we need to think differently, think bigger, and change the whole system. In 2040, we probably won't be driving here. We might ride an e-bike, jump on a new trackless tram, or an electric on-demand service. The pathway we are on is not inevitable. We can have a transition that doesn't come at the cost of sacrificing communities and ecosystems. Otherwise, what are we saving? <laughs>